today, the path we must follow, because the portion of the reading, if you notice, there kept being the word must. Um, so I kind of want to talk about that. But I kind of, anytime I talk about the manual for teachers, I like to kind of talk about first what is a teacher of God, because I've had some people go, well, I'm not a teacher. You know, I'm, I'm not one of you that works. You know, like I, you know, a bunch of us have title reverend, and I'm here full time. People are like, well, that's a lot of people, but that's not me. Guess what? The course says, yes, it is. Um, if you're here, I would almost guarantee you're going to classify into that as a teacher of God. Um, so there's a couple of things, and you know, this part wasn't in the reading, but I want to talk about it briefly. The main definition for a teacher of God says a teacher of God is anyone who chooses to be one. And you think, well, I didn't choose to be one. Well, maybe you did and you didn't know. It says his qualifications consist solely in this. Somehow, somewhere, he has made a deliberate choice in which he did not see his interests as apart from someone else's. In other words, if you said, you know what, my neighbor's important, my brother's important, what he needs is important, I care about what he needs, I you know, care as much as, about him as I care about me, you've just made that decision to be a teacher of God. And it may not have been like what you meant to decide, but you did, according to the course. That decision was made. And it says, you know, some people try to keep going and say, well, it's this and that. And it says, you know what, there's no specific demographics or religion for a teacher of God. It says they come from all over the world. They come from all religions and no religion. They do not look alike to the body's eyes. They come from vastly different backgrounds. And this is one that I think kind of riles a few people up. You know, you hear a lot of people say, oh, the Course is the way to enlightenment. Um, and I think it's a great way. I love A Course in Miracles. Um, but it also says the form of the Course, and it's Course little c here, varies greatly. But the content never changes. Its central theme is always God's Son is guiltless, and in his innocence is his salvation. This is a manual for a special curriculum, intended for teachers of a special form of the universal course. There are many thousands of other forms, all with the same outcome. And so for me, that says, you know, yeah, of course, in miracles is a way for us to learn, it's a way for us to awaken, um, whatever that means for you. But at the same time, it's not necessarily the only way. So I, I came from a church, my last church, and they tell a little bit of everything. Um, but we had Catholics, and we had Christians, and we had Buddhists, and we had Zen people, and we had science of mind people, and we had a little of everything. And it didn't make one better than the other, because it was just we were all saying the same course, we were saying, all saying the same curriculum. We were all teachers of God, it just came from a different form. We came from different backgrounds. And so I really like that the course, even though you know, I really love the course, you know, I say some other stuff too here and there. And it doesn't mean that it's wrong, it just means that it's part of the path that I've got. And so it says also, and this is I think one of the things I really, really like here too, is the Course acknowledges that we are experiencing this experience. You know, sometimes people say, well, I'm not by you, so I'm going to, you know, I'm going to ignore the world. Well, you kind of, you know, if you don't pay rent, I don't know a whole lot of people that don't end up homeless when they don't pay rent. Maybe there's somebody out there that can do that. I can't. If I don't pay rent, I get a call from my landlord, you know? Um, and I think the course here, and continuing with the manual, makes a point. It says, at the beginning stages of their functioning as teachers of God, have they as yet, or sorry, not, nor at the beginning stages of their functioning as teachers of God, have they as yet acquired the deeper characteristics that will establish them as what they are? These special gifts born in the holy relationship towards which the teaching learning situation is geared become characteristic of all teachers of God who advance in their own learning. For me, there's a part of that that says, listen, I'm acknowledging the experience you have. You're a teacher of God because you've decided to look at your brother and say, I care about this guy. His interests are as important as mine. He's one with me. But it also says there's an advanced teacher. There's a path. There's a progress. I've had some people say, well, you know, I, I read the course, so I'm good. I can just go do whatever I want. And that's true to an extent, but at the same time, the Course is saying there's a journey. There's a path of looking at what you're doing, what you're thinking, what you're experiencing, and moving through that. And even though that's an illusion, even though we're not these bodies, we're not limited, I'm not separate from Patrick, I'm not separate from Reverend Roxy, I'm not separate from Reverend Tedosia. Even though I'm not separate, I am having that experience. And so the Course says, at least temporarily, while you're looking like a body, you're going to have this experience of developing and of growing. 
And so in the first section, it talks about the characteristics of what they call the advanced teachers of God. And again, it says, you know, it says all teeth differences among the sons of God are temporary because we're not really these bodies, but we're having that experience. And the first one it talks about is trust. And it says this is the foundation on which their ability to fulfill their function rests. The teachers of God have trust in the world because they have learned that it is not governed by the laws the world made up. It is governed by a power which is in them, but not of them. It is this power that keeps all things safe. And so, you know, I, it's all my, I think almost every time I talk, I talk about one of my favorite sections of the course, talks about all things, you know, what would you do if you know that all things were gently planned for your good? And this is what, for me, that's what this is echoing. It's saying a teacher of God who's grown, who's gone down their path, that's worked towards what appears to be spiritual growth, realizes, yeah, I'm in this world, but I don't have to be afraid of the world because I can trust there's a God, there's a spirit that is keeping things under control. And so it says, how do, how does the teachers of God move to that point of believing that and living that and understanding that? And it gives six phases, um, six stages. And I'll say, I'm a little nervous about, and I won't do all six today, so just know, we're going home on time. Um, <laughs> I was like, I looked at it and I was like, yeah, okay, I think I talk again in a month. So we'll, we'll kind of come back to it if we need to. But for me, even though it says, you know, you go from one to the next, to the next, to the next, be gentle with yourself. There's times when you'll think, oh man, yeah, I've been really doing great spiritually. And then something comes along and knocks you on your rear. And you're like, oh my gosh, how did I end up here? You know, I thought, and I'm sure I've shared this before, but there's some new people too. You know, last, about a year and a half ago, I was in a job where, you know, there were some tough times, but I was like, man, I've been on the spiritual path really seriously for about four years now. Things are going great. I'm working full-time in ministry. I'm, you know, responding in a loving situation. Lost my job, lost my friends, and went into a deep depression for about three, four months. Like, days that I thought, you know, I don't want to get out of bed. I don't want to wake up tomorrow. And the only reason I got was because I knew my dog needed walks. You know, there was days literally the only reason I continued was because I had a dog that cared that I needed to take care of. And there's that part that it's like, you know, when you look at this, I'm, you know, if you look at the stages and you go, oh my gosh, that means I'm back at stage one. Yeah, maybe you are, maybe you're not. Maybe you're having experience of it, stage one, but that's not really where you're at. And so I kind of, I don't really necessarily like this one, two, three, four, five, six, because we tend to start placing ourselves in a number. And I would just say, be cautious of doing that. Recognize the journey is kind of like a spiral. You're going upward, but sometimes you kind of go, oh, it looks like I'm going downward. And you're still moving in the right direction, but you're going to have different experiences. And so, you know, if you look like you're back at step one, just be like, yeah, I'm going to trust that it's okay. And also the flip side of that is be willing to know that you don't know where your brother's at. I've seen people that have studied, like I had, teachings before of what was, you know, it was a different teaching, but they had four stages of spiritual life. And then I saw people saying like, oh, well, I'm a three, but I'm really struggling because my husband's a one. You know, you don't know what's going on. You don't know what's going on with your neighbor. You don't know what's going on with your friend. You don't know. You can look at their life and you may say, gee, it looks like that person's going through a rough time, but you don't know what's going on with them internally. And so for me, the stages are for the point of knowing that these things happen in our lives, and if we recognize them, saying, oh, cool, I'm going through a stage. And allowing ourselves to commit to becoming advanced teachers by being willing to work through these stages. And so the first stage says it's a period of undoing. And a lot, almost all these stages, over half of them say, stage doesn't have to be painful, but guess what? It probably will be. Because we go into ego. We go into what we want, and we're not willing to release it. And so the first stage talks about a period of undoing. It seems that things are being taken away, and it's rarely understood initially that their lack of value is being merely recognized. Sometimes that's going to call for external changes, but these changes are always helpful. That's that stage where you think like, okay, this is cool. You know, maybe I'm going to church. I think it was Marianne Williamson. Actually, I know it was Marianne Williamson. Said, so, you know, I was like, cool. I'm getting, I'm getting down with God. This is working. And, you know, 
she was expecting Holy Spirit to come and do a light, nice little remodel job, you know, put up some new wallpaper in the living room, that kind of thing. And suddenly it was like her whole life imploded. And she said, Spirit said, listen, the foundation was weak, there was rats in the attic, took the whole thing out. <laughs> and it was for her good. And so a lot of times we look and we go, oh my gosh, everything's falling apart. This last year, it was a rough year. And yet, I'm like, looking at it now, like, there's been so much healing and so much amazing things have come out of that. That we go through these stages where we look and we think, oh, I'm losing everything, and yet, these changes are always helpful. And so then it says, when a teacher of God has learned that much, you know, you may not be happy about being helpful, but you're like, okay, I'm going to acknowledge it's helpful somehow. I don't get it. Of course, as we move to stage two. And stage two says it's a period of sorting out. You start realizing, okay, everything's for my good, everything's helpful, but some things hamper my progress. Ultimately, it's all for my good. It's kind of like, you know, you, you know the Super Mario's game? You ever played that? You go running along, and you get the little Mario guy, running along, and you can go along the top, and you can go flying up into the sky, and, you know, at the end, you get to the end. It's a really great experience if you do that. And there's times you think, oh, I'm going to check out this little tunnel, and you end up in... You know, the little Mario Brothers hell, basically. Well, is it for your good? Well, the game's still moving forward. You're still getting to that end point. But you realize that if you go back and play that game again, you ain't going down that tunnel. The tunnel got you to the end, but it was difficult. It was painful. And so stage two is kind of like that, where you realize, oh, gee, you know, all these things are moving me forward. All these things are supporting my growth, supporting me in learning how to become an advanced teacher of God, is supporting me in learning to trust that God has got this. But there might be some detours that aren't so great. Maybe I can enjoy life a little better if I didn't make those choices. And so that's stage two. And it basically says you start realizing whether the things that are valuable, the things that support you, are the things that the Course says are real. Because those things that are real are of love. And so if you're in those little dungeons, it's like, hmm, okay, not a good choice, not some thought experience, not necessarily of God. And so then we go into the third stage, and it's called the period of relinquishment. And to me, this has some similarities to stage one, because again, you can have a lot of conflict. You're losing, things are leaving your life that maybe you thought you wanted. But... And it says, FYI, just if you've been like, oh my gosh, I don't like things leaving my life. It says, few teachers of God escape the pain on this stage. <laughs> like, we pretty much all go through it. We don't want to let go of our stuff. And yet, the difference between stage one and stage three, stage one is it may feel much more that you're the victim, that things are leaving your life, and you don't want them to, and they're going no matter what you're saying or doing. <laughs> stage three is things are leaving your life, but you realize that it's better, and you're allowing that to happen. You may even be an active participant in removing those things. You might end a friendship, you might end a relationship. You know, it's kind of like for me, it was going through a divorce. I knew that that relationship was unhealthy. It didn't stop me from drinking my butt off for three, four months afterwards because I was so upset. But I knew I needed to give up that relationship because it was unhealthy. And so stage three is that part of it where you're saying, oh, okay, Everything's helpful. Some things are more helpful than others. Some things are a little more painful than others. I'm going to be willingly give up these things. But there's that part of us that says, but I don't want to. And when we go into that I don't want to stage, that's where pain comes from three. We know it's for our good, but we got that little part that wants to hold on. And so we work through it. And it says, and I love this, the, set, the last part of this says, this stage is apt to be one in which the teacher feels Teacher of God feels called upon to sacrifice his own best interests on behalf of truth. He's given up the things he thinks he or she wants, he or think, she thinks are good for him, but they really know they're not. He has not yet realized as yet how wholly impossible such a demand would be. You can't give up that which is your best interest. If it's the best for you, God's going to have it for you. You can't get rid of it. He can learn this only as he actually does give up the valueless. Through this, he learns that where he anticipated grief, he finds a happy lightheartedness instead. Where he thought something was asked of him, he finds a gift 
bestowed on him. And that's where that's at. You know, like I said, I went through a divorce. It was horrible. The first few months especially, I basically, I would go home and I would drink for the purpose of getting drunk. About three, four months. And I literally would get drunk. I'd literally down about a bottle of wine, sometimes a couple of shots, in less than an hour and a half. And I did so because I'd be drunk enough that I could fall asleep. And I just wouldn't think. And I ended up, I finally, I got, I got, I got out of the really worst part after that. I must say after about six months, but there was about three, four months were really bad. And then I got out of it and I was like, oh my gosh. A year later, I'm like, that divorce was the best thing that happened to me. I was in a situation where I didn't feel good about myself. I didn't feel confident. I didn't feel like I was worthy. I didn't feel like I should be loved. And I came out of it. I actually, it's what got me back on the spiritual path. I lost, I hired a personal trainer who ended up becoming my spiritual teacher. <laughs> Just kind of funny, personal trainer teaching Course in Miracles. I'm not a body, but I'll see you at the gym. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was interesting. Uh, but that's where that got me. I, went, I got back on the path. I started feeling good about myself. I realized that God is love, and God loves me because I'm his creation. And so that stage three, that's where that's at. It's the looking at our life and going, oh, crap happens, and I got to let go of stuff but you start moving towards a space where you realize that the letting go is for your blessing. So like I said, there is three more sections, but um, I think a lot of these stages are the ones that we have frequently find when we're struggling. It's where we're really unhappy. It's the I don't want to let go stages. And I think it's, for me, it's very positive to have the course acknowledge that and to say, hey, there's people who are beginning, there's people who are more advanced teachers. It's okay. And by knowing these paths, by knowing these stages, when I experience them, I can go, oh, I'm having a different experience. This isn't maybe the stage I want to be in, but it's there. And spirit knows it because it included it in the course. And so I'm able to work through those moments saying, this is normal. I don't need to judge myself. I don't need to be angry with myself. I can let all that go. And I can live my life to the best I can, trusting that I can move in the, I don't want to say trust, that's the wrong thing, being willing to move in the direction of trust. Being willing to move in the space where it starts off that the advanced teachers of God know that this planet that we're seemingly living on is overseen by one much greater than ourselves who loves us. So thank you very much. That's my talk for today.